Good morning, Wellspring. We are in Romans 7, 15 to 25 this morning. And it reads, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that God, or for the good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So if I find this law at work, although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to that law of sin. like to welcome those of you that are online, those of you that are here. We are so glad that you are here this Memorial Day weekend. Now, Memorial Day weekend is a time for us to remember uh, and celebrate and honor those that have given their lives so that you and I can experience the freedoms uh, that we have in living in these great United States of America. But it's also, uh, I think it's very fitting as well to honor those that have served and that those are serving. So if you have served in the past in the military, would you please stand? If you have served or you uh, are serving, we absolutely celebrate you. We celebrate you. We thank you. We thank you for your service. We thank you for what you've done and we honor you. Thank you very much. I uh, also want to encourage you to come back next Sunday. Uh, do everything you can to show up next Sunday. Next Sunday, we're starting Romans chapter 8. And oh my, Romans chapter 8, some have said it's the greatest chapter in the Bible. Uh, it opens with, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And then it, the last chapter of that verse, it says, what shall separate us from the love of God? And he goes through all these things. It's just a fantastic chapter. Next Sunday, I think chains can be broken. I think people can find and experience some freedom as we allow the truth of God's word to move this long distance from our heads into our hearts in Romans chapter 8. Now, but to get to Romans chapter 8, we've got to sludge through Romans chapter 7. Okay, you're going to understand what I mean by that in a minute. Also, next Sunday, uh, if you have elementary children, I want to encourage you to bring them. We are going to have a glow party. Okay, we're going to have a glow party. It's going to be glow-in-the-dark bowling, uh, glow-in-the-dark dance party, uh, neon cupcakes, all kinds of fun activities next Sunday. And one of our theme for the year is engage, engage, engage 22. And I want to encourage you to engage. Go right ahead, Bruce. Oh, thank you. That would actually help. Um, Who knows what else I missed along the way? We will find out. So next Sunday, we are going to have a glow party. Invite your uh, elementary children or parents that have children if they want to come to a fun time, and then you can hear a fantastic message that I think can have profound life change for you. Uh, How many many of you have heard or read uh, about the story of um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Now, it's a classic story. It's, been, it's a novel. It's, it's uh, been written around. It's a classic story of right versus wrong, of joy versus despair, of, of the struggle of, of good and evil. See, the good Dr. Jekyll recognized inside of him there was something that would, that would sabotage his good, his good nature. He noticed this struggle, this internal struggle that, that he wrestled, wrestled with. And, 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 and this idea, he wanted to do the right thing, but it was sabotaged. And, and the dark side would actually disgrace the good side of Dr. Jekyll. So, so he has this brilliant idea as the story goes. I'm going to make a potion. And what I wanted to do was he wanted to separate the Dr. Jekyll, which is the good side, from Mr. Hyde, which is the bad side. So he had this thinking, if I could drink a potion and separate the two, 
then the good can, Dr. Jekyll can just be good and not be contaminated, if you will, by the bad side. And so he drank the potion to his horror. He realized that Mr. Hyde was significantly worse than he ever imagined. That Mr. Hyde was completely self-centered and completely self-absorbed in his own nature. Now, the author of this story, Mr. Stevenson, someone came to Mr. Stevenson and said, hey, where did you get this idea or where did you get this notion uh, for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? And he said, basically, um, he said, I found it in my nature, this, this illustration, this contrast of wanting to do the right thing and, and struggling to do the wrong thing or doing things that he hates or things that he doesn't want to do. And he made this statement. He said that inside every child of God is what he called a beast. And he's talking about that as a Christian, we have our old nature, our fleshly nature, and we have now Christ residing in us. We have a new nature. And Romans 7 is going to highlight Paul's personal struggles. And I love Romans 7 in the fact that it is the Bible is so real, it is so raw about his inner conflict that the Apostle Paul wrestles with. So if you have a Bible, open to Romans chapter 7. We're going to look beginning in verse 15. Paul says this, he says, For I do not understand what I do. He's confused. For what I want to do, I do not do. But the very thing that I hate, that's the thing that I do. I find myself getting sucked into. I find myself doing this thing. Can anybody relate? See, this passage orients us to our real reality. It highlights this war with inside of us, this civil war inside of us, this wanting to do the right thing but struggling and, and tempting and desiring. We want to do the right thing and we end up doing the wrong thing. We mess up time and time again. We feel like a POW, a prisoner of war to sin. We even pray and say, God, would you help me get victory over this sin? But we still, at times, can finding ourselves dropping the ball and missing it big time and failing and sinning to the point where some people have had the notion because we struggle with sin so much, some have said, I don't even know that I'm a Christian because a true Christian shouldn't struggle the way that I'm struggling. A true Christian should have more victory. And so we want to do the right thing, but we find ourselves doing the wrong thing, feeling trapped, a prisoner of war to sin. You can feel the angst and the struggle as we begin to read Paul's inner struggle of what he's wrestling with. The struggle is real. And last week, if you've missed last week's message, I strongly encourage you to go back and, and listen to that. But last week, we, we mentioned Romans chapter 6 and verse 12, where we said, Therefore, do not let sin reign or sin rule, and I love the verse, mortal bodies, so that you obey its evil desires. Now, we talked about the original language for the word desires there is epithemia. Everybody say epithemia. One more time. Epithemia means super desires, inflated desires. And inside us, our desires, because we have flesh, because we're made of flesh, we, we, we struggle. And our desires have one word. Our desires want more. How much money is enough? I need more I need just a little bit more, and we could go down the list of all the different things that we struggle with. Our desires say, I want it now. You can't afford it. But what do our desires say? Ignore the consequences. Hey, other people blow up their lives, but I can get away with it. Our desires say, I want it now. Charge it. Do it now. Indulge now. It, live for the moment. Respond in hate. Get them back. Tit for tat. 
It's what our desires do. They, they want to respond. Living in the flesh. Listen to me. Your desires and what you do with your desires, it will determine the direction and the quality of your life. And we've all seen, and we could all talk about stories of friends, of people that we know that have shipwrecked their lives because their desires turned into epithemia desires. Even ourselves. And so the struggle is real. Now, the Apostle Paul who is writing this, these, these words, he's probably the greatest, arguably the greatest Christian that has ever lived. He's written a third of the New Testament. And we're going to notice several things about him. And he's going to say out loud this internal struggle. We get an inside peek of the internal, the struggling match that he wrestles with. And he's going to say out loud his, his wrestling with sin of, of wanting to do the right thing, but doing the wrong thing, of, of allowing words to come out of his mouth that he wished desperately that he could take back. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. Now, Side note, Romans chapter 7, there's all kinds of debate of, is Paul a Christian in Romans chapter 7? Brilliant scholars on this side of the coin say Paul is not a Christian writing this. For a true Christian wouldn't say the things that the Apostle Paul is saying. Other, Christ, other great, brilliant mind scholars are on the opposite side, and they say, no, Paul is a Christian. He's just talking about the struggle. So what say you? I would say, I think Romans 7 is Paul is a Christian, but he's relying on his own strength. He's living in his own power. Paul, I believe, is a Christian because he desires to do the right thing, but he doesn't. And we'll see that in this passage, that, that he really wants to do the right thing, but he struggles with not doing what he knows he should do. And you say, Eric, well, why would you say you think he's also a Christian? And why do you think he's just a Christian who is living in the flesh, if you will? He's living in his own power. He's not empowered by the Holy Spirit. He's not living a spirit-filled life. Why do you say that? Because when you read Roman, when I read Romans chapter 7, I see over 30 times the word I, I, I. As you read through Romans chapter 7, I will scream off the page if you have a little pen and you circle all the times you see I. It's self-focused. It's Paul's strength, Paul's ability. Paul is not relying on the Holy Spirit. He's not living a spirit-filled life. He's living a Paul-filled life, a fleshly life, and as a result, we get the fruit of living on our own strength. Verse 15, let's, let's, uh, let's go there. Verse 15, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. Now, Paul says, I don't understand. He's saying that this mystery, this, uh, it's, it's, it's even, sin is even mysterious. He's baffled. He's confused by this, this wrestling match with sin that he is wrestling with. What I want to do, I don't. And what I do want to do, I don't. Do I have any golfers in the house? Maybe some of you that play golf, you could relate. You get up, and, and the, things, the things I want to do, I don't do, especially with my driver, okay? I don't really do it that much, but when I do... My driver, I just envision it, you know, going on the green. You know, I just, they just make it look, you just watch TV and they make it look so simple. I just go up there and hit the ball and it goes straight. But the things that I want to do, I don't. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. So if you're a golfer, maybe you can relate to the struggle. And Paul is talking about it. Paul is saying in verse 15, but the things that I hate to do, I find myself doing. This is true of all of us. In verse 16, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. Again, Paul is someone that is wrestling with it. Verse 17, as it is, no longer I myself, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living inside of me. See, we have flesh, and we're creatures of habit, some of us lived in the flesh for so long, now we have to unlearn and undo these habits that were destructive and sinful habits in our lives, namely our thinking and our behaving. And Paul looks inside as saying, basically, the sin has, has unpacked its suitcase and now it abides in my life. And wherever I go, if I go to work my sinful nature is there. If I'm at home, my sinful nature is there. Wherever I am, that sin resides inside of me. It has dwelled 
inside of me. Verse 18, for I know that the good itself does not dwell in me. And then he's going to define what he's saying. You're saying, what are you saying, Paul? And then he defines it. He's saying that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, this I keep doing. Can you relate? This is the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde struggle. That's how King David, who writes the Psalms of how much he loves God and worships God, and read the Psalms and his heart's bent toward God. That's how he can commit adultery and then murder. That's how Peter can deny Jesus time and time again, three times. It's in all of us. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does it. Okay, sin is like those trick candles. You have the, the candle, you have the birthday cake, and those, those little candles in there that you can blow on them and blow on them, but they just won't go out And you strive, and you struggle, and you want to do the right thing, but then your flesh gets in there, or you get triggered, and you respond, and you respond in a way that you, you find yourself with deep regret and deep guilt. And it's this old nature versus the new nature, that they're hostile toward one another. It's this battle within us that never ceases. It's a war that is always on. There's always a part of us that wants to, if you know Jesus, there's a part of us, we want to do the right thing, but, but we also want to indulge in sin. It's this tug of war inside of us. And maybe it looks like this for you. Maybe, it's, maybe you struggle with lustful thoughts. That you're thinking and and clicking around on sites that are fueling this lustful mindset. And now you can't even look at the opposite sex with purity because you're tainted by lustful thoughts. You want to do the right thing. You don't want to live in bondage. You don't want to have these big chains on you holding you down. And after you look at those things and and you experience those things, you have deep shame and regret because you know better. Maybe it's food. Hey, you you just don't want, you know, you want to just take a few pretzels. You just want to take a a, a few M&Ms, but you got the big family bag size, right? And before you know it, you ate the whole bag. Can anybody relate? And now you're sick. And now you want to go puke because you, you, just, you just indulged. I want, to, I want to eat just a few. But I find myself eating the whole bag. And I regret that. Maybe you're critical. Maybe, maybe you're negative. And maybe it's like a spiritual gift. I mean, my goodness, you can find fault in anything. I mean, just give you five seconds and you'll tell, point out how ten things were wrong. You can pick apart anything. You're masterful at it. Maybe fear. Maybe worry. Your mind struggles and, and your, your, your spouse is ten minutes late and you've already created the scenario in your head of the what if of my husband I'm sure is dead and, and I'm gonna, the, the hospital is going to call me because your mind just spiraled our stinking thinking, okay? It gets us into all kinds. We, we just think worst case scenarios instantly like that. Fear, worry, overspending. I've got to have the newest. I've got to have the latest. Well, is, doesn't your car work fine? Well, no, I need the, it's two years old. Yeah, but I need the new one. Hey, it's on sale. Hey, if something's on sale, I got to buy it. I, you can't afford it, but I got I to buy it. Just, it's on sale. It's screaming at me. It's like neon light. Buy me, buy me, buy. But you can't afford it. But you charge it. Or maybe drinking. Pressures of life. You're turning to alcohol, and now you're an addict, but you won't admit it. Or maybe you smoke things you shouldn't be smoking. 
And now you're a slave. You got this hook in you. Or maybe unforgiveness. You have unforgiveness in you. You can't forgive yourself because of what you did. And now you're carrying and living this weight in your life and everywhere you go. And the more weight we carry, the more we want to escape, which causes us to indulge in our sinful desires, our epithemia desires that causes us to lead toward greater destruction in our lives. Or maybe you're here and you say, Eric, I don't struggle with any of this. None of this relates with me. I don't know what you're talking about. You can just write the word pride on top of your little note card because you're full of pride. We're all vulnerable. I say it this way, we're all jacked up, every one of us. And Jesus wants to heal us, and he wants more and more freedom in our lives so that we're not yanked around by, controlled by sin or of the enemy. There's three things we fight, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And you are in the fight of your life. And what will you choose? How will you live? One day you'll stand before God, and God will say, how did you live your life? Romans 5, 16, it says this, So I say, walk by the Spirit. Do you do that? When people encounter you, is it evident that the fruit of the Spirit overflows from your life? Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness? Walk by the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Test the fruit. If you are not connecting, if you are not walking in the Spirit, here's what it says. It says this. It says, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not. You'll not what? Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires, the epithemia of the flesh. Are you walking according to the Spirit? Are you taking time daily to connect with Jesus? to spend time with Jesus, to allow Jesus' life to be poured into your life so you are living your life in step with the Holy Spirit. In other words, if you are not walking by the Spirit, you are carrying out the desires of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh, now the flesh is not dominant, but the flesh is present in all of our lives, desires what is contrary to the Spirit. That the flesh is self-focused, self-centered, self-absorbed. The spirit is the complete opposite. It's others focused, encouraging others, life-giving, also correcting. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary, there's this head-on collision, contrary to the flesh. Now the good news is the spirit is more powerful. The flesh literally sets its desires against the spirit. And they are in conflict, both butting heads eat with each other, so that you as a Christian are not to do whatever you want. He's, now, let me just say this. Because there is a real struggle, and because we see the Apostle Paul in this struggle, we could tend to say, well, if Paul struggled, that just gives me a license to sin. It gives me permission to sin, which I would say, don't do that. We talked about that last week. Whoever you present yourselves to, you become a slave of. And I don't want you living in bondage to a hard taskmaster that's going to take the life right out of you. And that's what sin does, and we'll look at that in a minute. Listen to this. Um, we talked about this last week. Genesis chapter 4, not this part. Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, it says, uh, listen to the imagery of this. Sin is crouching at your door. I think of a lion. That as you're going through the door, sin is right there, just ready to pounce on you. And you have an enemy that knows, studies you, knows your weaknesses, knows what things to tempt you with, and knows what things to tempt me with. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule it. You must master it. Here's a question. Where is sin ruling, dominating your life? 
there was an Indian who made a statement. He said, inside of every person, there are two wolves, the good wolf and the bad wolf. And the little boy said, well, which one wins? And he said, whichever one you feed the most. So if you begin to feed your flesh, you just do whatever comes natural. You're impulsive. You respond. Sin will be your master. Verse 19. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I want I do not want to do, this I keep doing. This is, this is this idea that our flesh, our flesh can be so impulsive. Our, 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 our flesh can say things before we've thought. Our flesh can, can do things before we've really begun to think about the, 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 the ramifications of what we just did. The flesh just is impulsive. And I think that's why you see these crazy um, uh, uh, labels on different items. Let's, let's go ahead and, and let's, let's look at a few of these uh, funny little labels, warning labels on, on these things. Now it says, warning, do not eat iPod Shuffle. Okay, I, I know that it looks really good. I know that it's like, man, that's really cute. I think that looks like a dessert. I should just, don't do it. Second one, drivers do not carry burritos. Okay, <laughs> you're driving down the freeway, and there, there you see a Chipotle. You pull up, hey, can you give me a burrito? Sorry, I don't have any. Impulsive. Let's go to the next one. These products not intended to use as dental drill. H- how did that come about? It's a dad with a drill, and his son says, I got a toothache. And he says, come here, give me that drill. Come here, come here son. Let me, let me, uh, let me get, get that. What's the next one? Warning, these products move when used. Okay, well, I, I, hope, I hope it moves. It's a scooter. When you, uh, when, let's go to the next one. Risk of fire. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, all right, yes, it's a... Uh, Supposed to. All right, let's go to the next one. Do not eat toner. Okay, I mean, I know it looks so nice, and your, your child is like, man, this toner, I think I just want to devour this, and he comes out like blue toner all over his face because he just devoured. Don't, don't eat toner. And then let's go to the next one, Jeff. Uh, chainsaw. Chainsaw. This is kind of funny. Um, Swedish chainsaw on the label, it says, do not attempt to stop the chainsaw with your hands or your genitals. <laughs> All right, don't do that. That would not end well. It's good to laugh. Verse 21, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there within me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. That's why I think he's a Christian. But I see another law at work in me, waging war. The war is within But I want you to notice where the war, where's the battlefield? Waging war against the law of my my mind. Listen to me. We're going to talk about this in a couple weeks. The, The battle is won or lost in our minds. It's where the battle is. And you, there's this inner civil war with our stinking thinking. And making me a prisoner, enslaved, if you will, of the law of sin at work within me. Paul says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Now, John Newton uh, penned the famous uh, song, the lyrics to Amazing Grace. And I think he may have gotten some of the lyrics from Romans 7. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a, a wretch like me. 
Paul is exacerbated. He's sick and tired of being sick and tired. He's sick and tired of blowing it. Oh my goodness, I blew it again. And guilt and the shame, I'm guilty. I hate myself. What a wretched person I am. I can't even live with myself. I can't believe I did it again. Guilt, shame. What do we do with that? Well, next Sunday, we're going to talk about it. Because I don't think we know how to process sin well. And then that has huge ramifications. Because now we're walking around with this giant boulder of guilt and shame. Because you're guilty. Because you did it. And now you're mad at yourself. And you struggle to live with yourself. And you don't know what to do with it. But there's a profound answer. And some of you next Sunday are going to come and you're going to discover and you're going to find freedom from God's word. It's going to change your life because you're going to allow Jesus to change your life and to transform your life. Paul is, and then Paul makes the statement, who, who will rescue me from, who will rescue me? Where do you turn? Where, what's the answer? Do, do I become more controlling? Do I become more strict? Do I go to a Tony Robbins conference? Do I, do I, do I look at my own? Do I become a victim? Am I, do I become hopeless? Do I just end my life because I'll never win the battle? I mean, wh- wh- who will rescue me? Where are you going to turn? Where are you going to tr- turn to find the victory? Where does that even look? Where do we go? Because the flesh always ends in death. Who will rescue me? The, the phrase, who will rescue me, is this, this I, rescue, is, it's the idea of rescuing someone from danger. It's the concept of a soldier that, who is rescuing a, a wounded comrade in battle and carrying him, putting him on his shoulders maybe, and carrying him to safety. Notice verse 24, the last part of that. Who will deliver me or rescue me from this body of death? Body of death. There's a tribe in Tarsus. Saul, Paul, was originally from Tarsus. And the punishment for a murderer, if you killed someone in Tarsus, they would take that dead corpse and they would tie it on your body. Strap it on. And eventually, because of decay, and disease, eventually you would die because of infection and decay. This was this, this, it was forcing the murderer to carry around the remnants of their sin. Then eventually it would kill them. And what Paul is saying is he's saying that I've got to get rid of this, this old nature. This, this old nature, it is, it, is, it is contaminated. The sin, the disease, the decay of sin, it is eating me up. And I've got to, I've got to get rid of it. That's what sin does. Sin always destroys. Sin always um, takes away. Sin always separates. Who will come to my aid? And then his answer in verse 25 is this. Thanks be to God who delivers me. How? What's the answer? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Romans chapter 7 perfectly positions us and sets us up for the answer, which is in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 7, Paul is living in his strength and his ability and pulling himself up by his own bootstraps. But it doesn't work. It doesn't bring about true life change. He needs a power outside of himself. And Romans chapter 8 is talking all about a brand new power that will enable us to not be flesh-led, but to be spirit-led. And and God knows our struggle, and God knows the struggle is real. And we need a new power that will enable us to live victorious. 
And that's through the power of the Holy Spirit reminding us that you and I cannot live the Christian life in our own strength and in our own ability and in our our own power. That you and I need the Holy Spirit's power in our lives so that you and I begin to daily begin to surrender and say, God, use my life to glorify you. I want to live a life that brings you glory and and, and, and honors you. I want to be spirit-led. I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want to be different. I don't want to be like the rest of the world. I don't want to be flesh-driven. I don't want to respond in hate. I don't want to respond in anger. I don't want to get you. I want to love you and care and pour and give instead of take. How can I bless you and how can I serve you? How can I be a blessing? How can I love my wife? How can I outserve my wife today? How can I love and invest in my children today where I'm pouring in them and, and the Spirit of God is overflowing from my life because I'm tapped into a power not of my own? And I don't verbally smack them because I'm mad at them and I'm carrying guilt and shame in my life. So now I'm negative and critical with everybody else, mad all the time. No joy in my life. No peace in my life. No harmony in my home because I'm filled with the flesh. I'm living according to the flesh. And it's obvious. Maybe not to me, but it's obvious to you. Because rarely will we have the courage to look in the mirror and face our own junk and our own guilt and the wrongs that we do because we don't know what to do with it. So we stuff it, and we pretend, and we bury it. The problem is it just keeps resurrecting because it didn't. you didn't deal with it. And, oh, there's a better way. God doesn't want you to pretend and excuse and deny and stuff. No, no, he wants you to face it. You hurt them. You hurt them by what you said. Your words have power. They're not just flippant words. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And what you do has consequences. And God wants us to live lives that are spirit-filled and spirit-indwelled and spirit-empowered and that it's evident the fruit of our lives is not flesh selfishness, self-centeredness. It's all about me. You inconvenienced me. Would you bow your heads with me for a second? I don't know what you're carrying. What, what, what sin are you carrying? You haunted by your past? Give it to Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Thanks be to God who delivers us through Jesus Christ our Lord. He doesn't want you to live that way. He doesn't want you to carry that anymore. He doesn't want you to, to go about living life in your strength and in your He wants you to be spirit led, spirit empowered, so there's so that you live differently. That's what he wants. And so would you just take a moment and confess and reconnect? God, I've been living in my strength. I've been living in my power. Jesus, I want to be spirit-led. I want to be different. I don't want to be like the rest of the world. So teach me. Because, Lord, I need you. I need you. Lord, I need you. God, I need you in my life. God, I want more of you in my life. God, I'm tired of living by the flesh. God, I want to be more spirit-filled and spirit-led and spirit-directed. God, I want more of you. God, I need you in my life. I'm tired of living the way I've been living. God, I don't want to live the same in this year. I want to be different. So do that in me. Change me. Make me more like your son. As we sing this song, may we pray this. And may this truth become a profound reality of our daily lives. 